Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. There are some verses in Scripture that are so famous, just coming to them is just kind of daunting as a teacher of God's Word because we don't want to mess with it. We just want to give it and help us understand what it says. Today's passage is like that. Today in our study of the Key Chapters of the Bible, we're turning to John chapter 3. We're going to be digging into this fantastic and famous passage. Can't wait to get into it with you. Hope this study is a blessing to you. It's been a blessing to my own soul as I've just been going back through God's Word again. So let's go to John chapter 3. As we come to John chapter 3, for brevity's sake, we had to skip over chapter 2. But if you had read chapter 2, then you know that at the end of the chapter, Jesus cleanses the temple of the muddy traders who are seeking to take advantage of people's sincere desire to worship God. Now, if you just imagine that scene there, you can imagine the uproar that that would cause. Here you got this lowly Galilean just like out of nowhere showing on up and just shutting down their lucrative commercial business saying, you guys are making my father's house into a house of business. And not only that, Jesus does this twice during his ministry. We've got it here in the beginning of his ministry. And then at the very end, only a few days before he's arrested and crucified, he also cleanses the temple one more time. And there seems to be an indication that the cleansing of the temple fed into the Jewish leadership's anger at him because he was basically cutting another coffers. I'm sure there are some guys saying, listen, if he does this every couple of years, we're done for. And so they want to just get rid of him. But that's all still to come. At this point, we're early in Jesus's ministry. So he cleanses the temple of chapter two. And in chapter three, a Pharisee named Nicodemus is intrigued by Jesus and wants to meet with him and find out more. And so verse two tells us that he comes to Jesus by night. Now, he probably did this because he didn't want to be seen talking with Jesus. And so verse 2 starts out with Nicodemus asking, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, Nicodemus is probably recognizing in order for Jesus to have actually cleansed the temple, God had to be working that moment because there's no way a single Galilean would have such a sway over the crowds of people in this sophisticated city of Jerusalem. Now, you would think that Jesus would give some kind of answer like, oh, yeah, you're right, God is with me. But he doesn't say that. Instead, he gives an answer which doesn't exactly relate to what Nicodemus had just said, except this is one of the most important verses in the Bible. And so John 3, verse 3, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, this verse is critical for us to understand. John is telling us, that the foundation of Jesus' message was the kingdom of God. Remember, Nathanael recognized Jesus as king back in chapter 1, verse 49. And Jesus has already begun to fulfill the messianic expectations for the kingdom in John chapter 2. And here, Jesus is putting the Jewish leadership on notice that the king has arrived to establish his kingdom. And yet, Nicodemus needs to understand that the entrance into this kingdom is not achieved by religious ritual or being a Pharisee or being on the right side of the political debate. The only way anyone can get into the kingdom of God is to be born again. Now, what does that even mean to be born again? Well, for one thing, it's a term that's describing being born into spiritual life. The only people who are a part of the kingdom of God who are those who are spiritually alive. Now, this, of course, implies that we are spiritually dead. There are many verses teach this point. The most famous is probably Ephesians 2 verse 1, which says, We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. And so if we're going to have spiritual life to be a part of God's kingdom, we must first be born again. But where does this spiritual life come from? And to answer that question, we got to understand what this word again is. The word again is crucial for us to understand. It's actually not the best translation. The Greek word is anothen. It's used 13 times in the New Testament. It's only translated again here in John 3. In fact, not every time in John 3. It's also used over in verse 31. And it's translated the way it normally is translated as simply above there. The word just really means above or or from on high. And so here in John 3, 3, we should translate this as unless one is born from above, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, we need to be born from above or born from God to enter into God's kingdom. Now, we saw this yesterday in John 1, verse 13, which says that God's children were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And so, in order for us to be born again, we need to be born from God. Now, this must have been a surprise because the Pharisees proclaimed a message of legalism getting to heaven. And so, Nicodemus was understandably confused. And in verse 4, he says, well, how can someone be born a second time? Now, what's funny is that when people ask a similar question in modern Christianity, 
we tend to say, well, just say this special prayer, as though there's some way that we can activate our spiritual birth by something that we do. The whole point of this passage is, just as we had nothing to do with our physical entrance into life, we also have nothing to do with our spiritual entrance into life either. It has to be a work of God. And in verse 5, Jesus reinforces this idea, saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The phrase water and spirit ties back to Ezekiel 36. That's that great passage we read a couple months ago, speaking of the new covenant. And in Ezekiel 36, 25, it says that the Lord, when he will establish the new covenant, he'll cleanse his people with clean water. In other words, he will wash them of their sins. And so we need his life to give us new birth, and we need his washing to give us cleansing of our sins so that we can come before God. And again, this is not something that we accomplish by a religious ritual. And so Jesus continues in verse 6, and he says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And so again, what the, this, he's just saying it in every different direction. It is the Spirit who gives birth to us. We do not give birth to ourselves. Now, this must have floored Nicodemus. And so Jesus says him in verses 7 and 8, Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. God does what he does. We're not going to understand it, and yet we can see his work like just the wind blowing through leaves. And we'll see what that looks like in a moment as we just continue through this passage. At this point, though, Nicodemus can only sputter. He's like, how can these things be? And Jesus is now amazed himself. And he says in verse 10, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? And the reason why Jesus says this is because these principles are not new. This is what Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel have been prophesying all along. This is what the people were waiting for. At least they should be waiting for. And if the Jewish leadership didn't recognize this, that's a bad sign. And so verses 11 to 10 explain that this is exactly what Jesus came to accomplish. He has come to bring the reality of these prophecies to his people. But because Nicodemus doesn't understand God's work of salvation, and Jesus just continues to explain it to him. And so he tells Nicodemus in verse 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And so what's he talking about there? Well, if you've been listening to these podcasts for a while, or if you just know God's word, Back in February, February 15th, we looked at Numbers 21 and the account of the bronze serpent. And, and people were being bit by snakes, and, and God had Moses create a bronze serpent put onto a pole. And anyone who believed God and believed Moses' message and looked to the bronze serpent was healed and saved. Now, that whole event in Numbers 21 is actually just pointing to the Messiah who would be coming 1,500 years later. And so just as looking at this raised-up serpent brought salvation to the Jews in Numbers 21, we too need to look to Jesus, who has been raised up on the cross for our salvation. Verse 15 says, So that whoever believes will in him have salvation, as in eternal life is only found in Christ, no one else. Just like you can only be saved back in Numbers 21 by looking at the serpent, there is no other solution. Likewise, there is no other solution to the problem of our sin, but through Jesus and his cross. And then Jesus says the most famous verse in the entire Bible, John 3.16. John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now this verse gives us just an amazing promise as well as the components of salvation. The promise here is a salvation from hell, the gift of eternal life, and it's a life that does not end. And it is for those who believe. Those who believe are the ones who have this life. And now the word for belief in Greek means to trust or rely upon something. Going back to Numbers 21, the people had to rely upon God's promises to be healed if they looked to the bronze serpent. Even if it wasn't even clear, they were still relying upon God and his promises. In the same way, we need to trust in God's promises for forgiveness if we look to Christ to be our Savior. Believing in Christ or looking to Christ simply means believing that he died on the cross for our sins so that the penalty of our sins was fully paid for by him. And yet we're seeing here from John 3 verse 3, the only way we can believe with the kind of faith that God would accept is to have faith that's the result of being born again. We've just mentioned that being born again is a work of the Holy Spirit where we are born from above. And here we're seeing when the Holy Spirit works in someone's life, here's this rustling of the leaves that Jesus spoke about in verse 8. He gives them belief. He gives them faith. He gives them the ability to believe these things and trust these things. Those who believe are born again because true faith is impossible without the work of God. 
this kind of faith trusts God's teaching, that we don't have anything in ourselves to even enter into this kingdom, that, that it is God who in his mercy gives us life and washes our sin and forgives us and, and gives us his eternal life. And this faith is given to us by the Holy Spirit. And we know it's from the Holy Spirit because as we grow in Christ, our trust continues to grow as well. As we learn more of what God has said, the tent of our faith continues to expand and trust in what he has said. And we begin to trust that Jesus is God and King, and he has announced his kingdom, and he has made the way possible through his cross, and he will come one day, and he will return to judge the world and establish his kingdom once and for all. And those with his true Holy Spirit-given faith believe these things and trust these things and anticipate them and look forward to them. You get a glimmer of this in verses 17 to 18, which says, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Then verse 18, He who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now verse 18 makes us feel a bit uncomfortable because it indicates that ultimately God is the one who determines our fates. Verse 36 echoes a similar thought, saying, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides, present tense, on him. I recognize that that may make us feel uncomfortable, but that is what Christ has revealed to us. But all of this just ties together the message that our salvation is entirely of God. He does the work in us, bringing about this new life. And when we are spiritually alive, we call out to him with true faith. We recognize his authority and his rule in life and we'll submit to him and what he has said about our need for his grace and forgiveness. And all of this just underscores this principle of being born again, being born from above, being born of the spirit is entirely a work of God. And yet, when God does give us life, we're like that kind of new baby that's crying. You know, we've just been born, we're crying on out and we cry on out and we call out to God. That's why you got a verse like Romans 10, 13, which say, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We must call upon the name of the Lord. That's how we know we're alive. But we also have to recognize that the only way we can truly call upon him for salvation is by him giving us the faith to believe that any of this is true. Well, going back to John chapter 3, focusing now on verses 19 to 21, there is also the clear evidence of God's judgment. Verse 19 says, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. Uh, verse 20 says, for everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. And so those who are the Lord's people will turn to God and call upon him as God and King. But those who are not his people, they'll hear this message, they'll turn from it and they'll even scoff at it and pursue darkness with that much more of an intensity. That's not to say that every rebel has no hope in God. Paul hated Jesus at first, but God stepped into Paul's life and brought about a spiritual conversion. In my own life, I was once not a believer and thought that all this Christianity stuff was just silliness. But then the Lord got a hold of my life through tragedy and pain. And, and on August 17th, 1990, in just one day, I went from a total mocker of Christ to a submitted father of Christ. It can be done. It is the work of God. We have a God who works in us and among us. And when he does and has, we believe what he has said. Now, that's all John 3. Well, for the most part, there's actually a little bit more here. And the rest of John chapter 3 just summarizes the transition of John the Baptist's ministry to the ministry of Jesus and how he has followers. And he's just pointing them all to Jesus as Savior. And again, that's important to remember because John was writing this gospel from Ephesus. And in Acts 19, we see that Ephesus still had a lot of followers of John the Baptist. And so they would all be particularly interested in understanding the tie-in between John the Baptist and the Messianic King. So now that's all of John chapter 3. How do we apply this passage? I think the most important question we can ask ourselves is, am I born again? Have I been born from above? How do you know? Well, there's that little letter that John writes, 1 John, the 1 John letter. Uh, that really goes through the details of what it looks like to be truly a born again father of Christ. But basically, you can ask yourselves, do I believe these things? When I hear the word of God, do I hear them as the words of my king and do I believe them? And if so, and if you've called upon Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, then he is, and he's your God and King, and you have eternal life. But if not, and if you're wrestling with these things, maybe it's time to come to this place of submission where you're hearing all this and you're like, you know what? I just got to submit to it. That's what the Word of God says. And we come to him and we say, Lord, I submit to you. You're God, you're King. What you have spoken is wise and good. And when you have said, I'm a sinner, when you have said, I need your life within me because I have no life in myself, I believe it. And you call upon him to be your Lord and Savior. And then, if you have, we then all together just continue to come to God's word 
looking to what our King has said and walking and living in light of the fact that our King has come, He has spoken, and He will one day return again. Well, so much more can be said about John chapter 3. It's a fantastic chapter. We've covered it in only 10 to 15 minutes. Hopefully, you have a rich understanding of what it says and a rich understanding of the King that it points us to. Thanks so much for listening. Hope you have a great rest of your day. We'll catch you tomorrow. And until then, God bless.